I, I know I pick on Saul sometimes, but Saul's just so easy to pick on when you want to find somebody that did something that wasn't right, and you don't want to learn that lesson. But Saul was king of Israel, and God instructed him to do a mission for him. He said, I want you to go after those Amalekites, and I want you to utterly destroy them. And he gave him details of what he wanted him to do. He said, I want you to kill man, woman, and child. I want you to kill all the animals. I mean, destroy everything. Because the Amalekite sin in God's eyes was so horrid that he wanted them destroyed. And, and he didn't want them to be an influence on Israel. And so Saul went out and he did that. Not really. But he comes back and he said, did what you asked, accomplished the mission. And, and God said, oh, Samuel, go talk to this guy. Ask him, what is that bleeding of the sheep and the mooing of the cows that I hear? And, and Saul said, oh, the people brought those. And then he said, okay, who's this dude that you brought in here with you? He said, oh, that's King Agag, the king of the Amalekites. So God gave him instructions, and he came back and he said, I did just as you asked me to. But what really happened? Saul said, we did it. But they didn't. They brought cattle back. And Saul was pretty quick on his feet when it came to thinking. And so when God said, what are those cows doing? He said, oh, the people brought them back to her sacrifice for you. Now you've got to understand the Jews, they, they had a struggle with this because they, the, the sacrifices became very important to them. They thought that is what pleased God. They forgot that the sacrifice was merely something to atone for sin, and what really pleased God was an obedient and faithful heart. And so they forgot about that. And so they thought the sacrifice was important. That's why they brought the animals back. And God was not happy. And then he said, about this king, like, why is he here? Well, he's kind of my prize. I'm the king of Israel, and I down the king of the Amalekites. And God said, no, no, no. I downed them. You didn't. You were just my messenger or my servant, but I'm the one that caused the downfall. Now, they knew better. They knew better than that. But Saul decided he would try to justify himself. First, he deflected the blame. He said, well, I'm, it's not my fault. I'm only the king. He didn't want to be the king at that point because he was responsible for the people. But he allowed the people to do it, so he said, ah, it's the people. And, then, and so he wasn't obedient to God, he wasn't faithful, he made excuses, and the long and short of it is, he came out on the short end of the stick. He did not deceive God, he did not pull the wool over the eyes of God. But you know, Israel tested out that theory with God over and over. They tried to do that. And the prophet Micah gives us some insight as to what it'll be like when we enter the courtroom of God. I don't know how many of you are looking forward to standing in the courtroom before God the judge. But Micah gives us an idea what it's going to be like. And so I thought this morning we could look at that and maybe learn how not to fall into that uh, trap of sin. Some of you have maybe heard this sermon before. I don't know, not this sermon, but one like it. Um, because I may have done one years ago on this one. But I thought it would be really good to cover it again today. So we have the case. God comes in Micah chapter 6. And, and he says, Arise and plead your case before the mountains and the hills. Let the hills hear your voice. Hear you mountains the indictment of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has an indictment against his people and he will contend with Israel. 
And he says, oh my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of slavery. I sent before you Moses and Aaron and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. So God comes to Israel and he says, I have a grievance with you. I have a complaint about you, and I want you to answer. My complaint is, uh, what have I done to you that's so bad? How have I made you tired? You see, what Israel had done is over and over, they would forsake God, and they would turn to idols, and they would turn to different things, and, and chase after their desires, and just slowly wander away from God, till God corrected them, and brought them back, and then they would repent, and, and, and they'd come back, and then they'd slowly start down that path, and they'd go down that path again. And God's saying, why? Is it because I freed you? I mean, think about what I did for you. I took you out of Egypt, out of slavery. I made you a free people. And unless you've been in really bad slavery, you don't understand what freedom is. Most people today don't appreciate how free we are in Canada. The freedoms we do have. But when you're in serious slavery and you are given freedom, it is such a weight gone. It is so good. He said, is it because I did that for you? You know, I took you up from Egypt and, and I gave you this whole land flowing with milk and honey, the promised land. I've given it all to you. Was that a bad thing I did? Is that why you, you're tired of me and you want to turn away from me? Oh, maybe it's because I gave you that great leader Moses who led you faithfully for 40 years. Maybe him and his brother and his wife, they, they weren't good enough, right? I burdened you with them. Is that what it is? Oh, and you know King Balak there and the deception he had planned for you, how he tried to get Balaam to convince you to do a certain thing so that he could get you and kill all of you and destroy you, and instead I saved you from all. Is that the problem? I need to understand, and I'm going to call you, I'm calling you to tell me. Now it's interesting, the witnesses that God calls on. He calls on the mountains and the hills, and you say, huh? How can that be? How can they be witnesses? How can the mountains witness about God? How can the hills witness about God? Well, the Bible talks about that in several places. In fact, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, he says that creation itself testifies about God. And so creation is a witness. And it's interesting because the Lord Jesus, when he had his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, when he was entering into Jerusalem and they were all praising him and calling him Hosanna and King and, and all of these things, the Pharisees stand there and they say, shut them up. Do you hear what they're saying? Shut them up. And he looked at the Pharisees and he says, were I to shut them up or to tell them to stop, the rocks themselves would cry out. Now you think about that. God says to Israel, I'm calling you to court. I want you to answer what I have against you. And our witness, your witnesses are going to be creation. What better witness is there of the power and the majesty of God than creation itself? And he says, that's my witness. Well, we look at that, and he's contending with Israel. He's taking them to charge. But does God contend with us today? He does. God has, if you look at the world around you, 
God has a whole lot of things that he could have a complaint about. About how people act, how people are treating each other, how people, all the different things that people are doing. Think about this. He gave us Jesus, his one and only son. He sacrificed him on that cross so that we could live. That, his love for us put his son there. Our sin put his son there. But he gave us Jesus. And people just dismiss that with the wave of a hand. They just ignore it like it's nothing. They mock it. They treat it with mockery. People are faithless. And so does God have a complaint today? Absolutely, he has a complaint today too. He's the same God. And he'll call the same witnesses. And we will have to answer one day. There's nothing new under the sun. And so God had a complaint. Now, I want, to he I want you to see what Israel said to God. Let's read it in, in Micah chapter 6. Starting in verse 6. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? With the Lord, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Israel, in this play, in this case, does exactly what Saul did. Little different wording, little different scenario, but the same thing that Saul did. With what shall I come before the Lord? This is little wretched me. What can I possibly do to please God? I can't please Him. That's what they're saying. And then they turn to the only thing that they thought pleased God. Because they missed the boat. They missed the whole heart thing. But what they did is they said, well, does a burnt offering, a calf, really do it for God? Does that really make God happy? Like when we, when we sacrifice a calf and we burn it on the altar, God get all excited and start jumping around and, 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 and really like that? No, that, that wouldn't work. What pleases the Lord? As if they didn't know. What pleases the Lord? They're asking. They say, what, what pleads? In other words, it's a real slap in God's face. Because what they're really saying is, you're expecting us to please you and we can't. And God was asking that of them. So they said, well, maybe a thousand rams, right? Nah, a thousand rams wouldn't work either. That's a lot of rams. <laughs> it's a lot of sheep to sacrifice. No, that, not even that. That wouldn't make you happy, God. Now, they're making decisions for God, right? And they said, maybe 10,000 rivers of oil. See, all of these things they used in the sacrifice or the different sacrifices. And they said, but we know that none of that really makes you happy, God. Oh, maybe you want my firstborn. Now this is really turning it in God's face. Maybe you want my firstborn, the flesh of my body, for the sin of my soul. God had provided for them a replacement so they didn't have to dedicate their firstborn to him, every family. It was called the tribe of the Levites of the priesthood. And he had given that to them. And they're throwing this back at him. But what's worse is, while they're doing this to God, they're throwing their babies in the fire to the idol Molech. Now think about that. How awful that is. And they have the nerve to stand in the courtroom of God and say, huh, there isn't a thing that we can do to please you. And you know, that has carried through all of the generations. Every generation has had that problem, 
has used that excuse? The Gnostics in the first century, they said, you know, we can't control our bodies. We're not even responsible for what my body does. Because if I just have up here in these six inches a higher knowledge of Christ, then that's where I really want to be. That's where I want to live. And so up there I'm with Christ. Whatever my body does, that's out of my control. Now that goes directly against the gospel. But that's what they were teaching. And all it was was an excuse or a justification or something to, along that line to say, I don't want to control my body. And I want to do what my body wants to do and what it desires to do. And a lot of that was participating in sexual immorality and all of those things. And that was their excuse. They said, we can't control the body. Up here I'm connected with Christ. Today, people struggle with it. People struggle with all kinds of things. And they blame God for it when it doesn't work out. But they don't ask God before they go after something to see if it's right with Him. But boy, when it goes south on them, God's the problem, isn't He? He's the fault. You know, a lot of people today believe that very same thing, that we can't please God. And at the end of this, we'll see. But I've had people say to me, they'll quote Isaiah 64 and verse 6. And they'll say, all our righteous deeds are like filthy rags to God. So I can't do anything to please God. They will quote Romans, the end of chapter 7 in Romans. And they will say, we can't help it, we're sinners. We can't help, my body wants to do one thing, I want to do another thing when Paul's talking there. And Paul isn't talking about this. But he, they'd say, now that I'm a Christian, I can't help it, my sin, because my body wants to do something. That's a Gnostic teaching. It's not right. It's not what that's saying. What Paul is saying is, when I tried to do it by the law, I couldn't. But when I do it in Christ Jesus, I can. There is no condemnation, verse 1 of Romans chapter 8, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because our life, we live for Christ. And so people will try to tell you today, you can't please God, you can't do right. And they will make up excuses and they will justify, just like Israel did. But let's check out, go back to God's courtroom, in Micah chapter 6, and let's check out how that worked out for Israel. Verse 8. He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Oh. Oops. We knew that. Didn't we? They knew that, didn't they? They knew that's what he required of them. He says, he told you. He told them over and over and over through different prophets, through different visions, all these different things that happened in the Old Testament. He told them over and over what he expected of them. When they came into the promised land, he told them how to live in that promised land. And if they didn't live that way, what would happen to them? He told them. And they said, we don't know. We can't please you. And he said, yeah, you can. I told you, do justice. Love kindness. Walk humbly before your God. You see, they like too much robbing the poor, taking money from the poor and enhancing their coffers and making themselves rich. They like doing that. And so they didn't want to listen to God. And they weren't kind to people. You know, I understand it's really hard when someone's unkind to you to be kind to them. 
But if we look to the example that we have in Jesus, he was treated pretty unkindly. And he died for them and prayed for them at his death for their sins to be forgiven. That's kindness. So do you retort with unkindness when you're treated unkindly? Or do you treat them with kindness and pray for them? Jesus said, pray for your enemies. But their excuse was they didn't know, but God said, yeah, you know. And you know what it means to walk humbly before me. See, they were arrogant and prideful and thought they were something. You know, we can do the same thing in our Christianity. We can think we're something because of Christ. Well, we're just forgiven sinners. That's all we are. And servants of the Lord Most High. And we're nothing special. We just have forgiveness. And we ought to rejoice in that and remember that He's extended that grace to us. And that's why we are who we are, not because of what we've done or anything, how great we are. You see, Israel knew what God wanted from them. And people today know what God expects of us. He's told us, it's all here. I can read you a hundred passages in the New Testament that tell you what God expects of you. And you can't sit there and say, but I don't know. Or that wouldn't please God. Yes, it would. And I'll tell you why. There are people that will tell you, it doesn't matter what you do, you can't please God. Well, let me tell you what God made you in Christ Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, Paul is talking to the Ephesian church. And he says, you are saved by grace through faith. It's nothing you did of yourself. God saved you. But then in verse 10, he says, For we are, and the we there is those who are in Christ, okay? So, for we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus, oh, oh, here it is, for good works. Hmm. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He created us in Christ Jesus for good works. Now think about that. If we do the good works, the works that Jesus did, that gave, he gave us the example of and commands us to do, would that not please God? Would that not please God just as much as it would have pleased God if Israel had just given Him their hearts and devoted themselves to Him and were faithful to Him? Absolutely. That's all He wants. He wants our hearts. He wants us to be faithful to Him, devoted to His service in His kingdom. Live such good lives, Peter says, that when they stand before God, the Gentiles will praise God. You think that doesn't please God? If you live that kind of life? It absolutely does. Paul said in Galatians 6 and 10 that we ought to treat everyone with kindness, especially those of the household of faith. So, yes, we can please God. It isn't about, we can't, we can. The question is, and the only question is, do you want to please God? You see, we all have a life. We all live this life. We make choices. We do things. We act certain ways, whether it's just or unjust, whether it's kindness or meanness whether it's walking humbly with God or walking in pride. We all make choices and we all die. That's just a fact of this life. We are all going to meet the God of heaven. We will be in his courtroom and we will plead our case. We will stand before the judge 
And what we have to figure out is what will our plea be? See, we can be like Israel. And we can say, well, Kevin made me do it. Brock deserved it. So and so, they were just asking for it. The things they said to me, what did you expect to come out of my mouth? And we can make all of these excuses and justifications. And you can say, well, in that situation, God couldn't possibly expect me to please him. So you can take that route. But you know from this morning it didn't go well with Israel when they took that route. Or you can be like that tax collector. And you can beg for the mercy of God. Recognize your sin, own it, repent of it, and when you face God, have mercy on me because I'm a sinner. But trying to do what's right and to live for Christ. See, we have that choice. And we're all going to be there one day. Some sooner, some later. But we're all going to be there. And so today, it would be a good idea, if you are not right with God, to do that. If you're not ready to be in the courtroom of God, you might want to just take another look at that, consider that. And if we can help you with that, we'd love to help you to learn what it is God wants you to do and how he wants you to walk because the reward is well worth it. So if we can help you with that, we invite you to come now while we stand and sing. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten to Him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to Thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one, He is the just one, He hath the words of life. I will hasten to Him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to Thee. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what He saith, do what He willeth, He is the living way. I will hasten to Him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to Thee. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter in. I will hasten to Him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to Thee. You may be seated.